Progressive World Podcast with your hosts, Drea Klein Bergman and John Daniele, brought to you by the Progressive World Federalists, a civil society organization that examines global policy through a progressive, anti oppression lens. host, Drea Klein-Bergman, a policy researcher, and John is off kicking hackers' butt today. In today's episode, we will examine the rise of far-right politics in France. Can Prime Minister Macron hold on to power in the upcoming elections? And I'd also like to talk about Marine Le Pen's reappearance in the political scene. So it's my honor to welcome back Dr. Tom Brewer. He is currently teaching at Vives University College. Tom, thank you for walking us through what is happening right now in France. My pleasure, and thank you for having me again. Sorry, Tom. I really couldn't help myself. No problem. This is actually, well, quite funny for Belgian ears because we had, well, one of our former prime ministers, when asked if he could even sing the Belgian national anthem, started singing the Marseillaise, the French one. So, yes. So that just shows shows how, well, dysfunctional Belgium was at that time, politically speaking. Uh, But yeah, let's talk about France today. So the next federal elections is coming up here next year in April of 2022. But first, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the, I I would call them physical assaults on the prime minister that's been happening as of late. So back in June, he was publicly slapped in the face. And I know that he claimed that was from the far right. Um, and then, you know, we see his numbers are slipping across the board. And then on top of this face slap, we just saw last week, he was, I guess I'll, I'll describe it as being pelted with an egg and was, I think it was Lyon. Uh, but Tom, what is your reaction to these physical assaults? Well, of course, it's just astonishing to see, but in a way it's not surprising because of course it it shows you how unpopular he is as a president. Uh, It's been four years since he was elected, the youngest president of the Republic with this new movement, uh, La République En Marche. And of course, one of his pledges, well, he pledged to break the old system, uh, to be unhindered by party politics and a party platform. So there was lots of hope a couple of years ago. So it's really sad, you could say, and astonishing to see this to see how unpopular he really is. And of course, over the course of these last years, we had the protests of the the Gilets Jaunes, almost popular uh, protests, manifestations in Paris and and all the big cities um, against the rising cost of living, uh, prices for basic commodities and so on. And slowly there was this, um, yeah, image um, taking hold of him being a former investment banker, being quite arrogant, not having any contact with uh, the people, you could say. And what's really interesting too, like the ep- episode you um, described with the egg, him being pelted with a hard boiled egg. Well, the guy who threw the egg was actually shouting, Vive la République, you know, long live the ah. And that's really interesting, you know, to see these, well, slogans and chants popping up in these popular protests. Um, And I'm sure it won't be the last time. Uh, I hope, well, the president isn't attacked every week or during every visit he makes. But yeah, people are not surprised. And it shows you also that there's lots of tension in the buildup towards the election, a lot at stake. Uh, Well, not just for France, but for Europe. So yeah, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens uh, next year in April. Agreed. And I think it's time to kind of move into what I'm going to describe as the scary stuff. 
Um, so talking about, you know, far, France's far right party and and just for um, comparison, Canada has its own far right problem. Uh, we just also had national elections held here uh, last month, and it was called a, it's what's called a snap federal election on the 20th of September. And there's this newish far right group. Um, which is called the People's Party of Canada or the PPC, they didn't gain any seats, <clears throat> excuse me, any seats. But what is um, significant is that back in 2019, they were only 1.6% of the voting population. Now they jumped to 6%. So roughly 800,000 people voted in that for, for the, this party in the last election significant. And this is uh, the same pattern that I'm seeing uh, throughout Europe, and I'm seeing it especially in France. So can you give our listeners kind of a down and dirty, I would call it, of France's far-right party, the National Rally, which is led by Marine Le Pen. And yeah. her eth yeah, her ethos and ideology, really, I would kind of summarize, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is this sort of mythical France and returning to the to the French language and very similar to what we've been seeing, you know, what happened under Trump in the United States and how his followers latched on to that. So Tom, can you kind of break that down for us? Yeah. Well the the national rally, so the Rassemblement National in French, is in fact the new name of a party that was known for decades as the National Front and the, the Front National founded actually by Marine Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who, who was a well-known figure, of course, in French politics. And that party actually emerged from post-World War, World War II politics. So basically a very um, typical extreme right, far right party, xenophobic. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen you know, was known to make the odd anti-Semitic remark, uh, was shunned by the political establishment. And well, Decades since 1972, of course, he entered politics and each election he got a couple of percentages uh, in the polls and the actual election. But it was a big shock in 2002 when he actually reached the second round. So you have to know with the French election, uh, there's a first round where all the parties, of course, can participate. But then there's a run up between the two main competitors. And in 2002, that was actually Jacques Chirac, uh, the former French president, against Jean-Marie Le Pen, who, by surprise, uh, um, reached... Yeah, it was a place. shock. It was a shock, because the Socialist Party lost big time, and you had him actually competing for the presidency in the second round against Jacques Chirac, who, of course, got 80, 85% um, in total, and everybody shunned uh, Le Pen. But still, it was a sign for things to come. And then Marine Le Pen took over power, in 2012, so almost 10 years ago, but she radically changed the party, not basically the ideology, of course, but the, let's say the optics, the PR. The image, the yeah. Yeah. And of course, with her being a female leader of such a party, um, she wanted to um, de-demonize, let's say, the, the party, the PR, normalize the party in French politics. And in a way she succeeded because the last election, it was in the second round again, she faced off Macron, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who eventually became president, of course. But the margins were far narrower. And now the big fear in France, and it was already the case in 2017, is that not only will she reach the second round, but imagine if Macron cannot rally all the votes on the left and the right, because all of these traditional political parties have uh, splintered or disappeared, what if she can actually win this? Something her father could have never done because of his attitude, because of his persona. Uh, but she managed to normalize this extreme right party. And some people actually give her a chance in a runoff against Macron now this uh, next year in 22. We can actually see that happening. Um, and you know what, what I remember from back in the day from her father was he was very avid in, in public speaking about denying of the Holocaust. And I yeah. thought, 
well, this is this is crazy. How can we how can we be here? But you know, it is it's quite common. The more more I got into politics as a young mm -hmm. adult, the more I can see it's still a very common thread. Um, and and um, she, I don't know if she's been answering those questions about you know how the party was originally formed and her stance on that. Um, but as you said, I have seen the same ethos and ideology that was there from the beginning continue. It's not like it's a new party. They just have a different way of presenting themselves that's more acceptable. And, you know, I'm looking at the the poll numbers that have been coming out and she's higher by a couple percentage points than Macron right now mm -hmm. versus back if you look at the polls at this time in 2017, she was behind by three or four percentage points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is disconcerting. Yeah. And I'm now saying, and especially after you know we watched in shock and horror with Trump getting elected, mm -hmm. um, I'm now seeing this as a possibility of her making it to the second round. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at, so then I started digging into some of the um, uh, surveys that they've been going around and they're leading in a lot of the different regions, not just one particular area. So, I mean, there, there is a possibility, I think, for like sweeping gains for the party. Yep. And, and especially because of the dissatisfaction with Macron, I can see a high number of abstention vote rates. So then we're left with these extremes. Yeah, because François Hollande before him lost uh, one term president, the much hated Nicolas Sarkozy, who is now being indicted and has. I was just going to say he's court case, right. So he he's not doing change. well these days. No, no, no. So Macron could actually become the next French president to lose a second term. But Marine Le Pen is still there, election after election, and she's building that momentum again. Last time, apparently, she messed up in, during the debates. Of course, she'll be well prepared again. And Macron is really unpopular. Um, we've got a different, you know, French, European, and global context, as you said. You know, we've had Trump, we've had Brexit, and so on. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see what happens with uh, Marine Le Pen, but. It could be a certainty that she will get to the second round. I, I don't know if it will be to face off against Macron or even another candidate, but she's the main front runner, you could almost say now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I want to, like, you, you just talked about um, Brexit. What is frightening for me to think about the future of Europe is one of, I mean, her rally cry for her party platform is you know in her first 100 days she's going to be exiting the EU. Yep. Uh, honestly, it scares the shit out of me. Um, what 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 do you think is going to happen to the EU if France falls to populism and they exit the EU? Well, I think it would be a catastrophe because of course everyone knows that France and Germany are, uh, well, the main partners inside of the EU, the biggest economies, the most powerful nations, economically, mil militarily. Um, and of course, now that Britain has officially uh, left the European Union, um, well, it will be a disaster for Europe. And of course, the alliance with the Germans would be shattered. And even there, we had an election just recently, uh, to uh, last week, uh, last weekend, and we don't even know who the next chancellor will be after 16 steady years, you could say, with Angela, Angela Merkel at the helm. So you have that also coming into play. Uncertainty about Germany. Maybe they could withdraw, not out from the European Union, I mean, but the Germans could focus more on themselves, on the economy, on the recovery after COVID, and just maybe not be as involved as Merkel was on the European level and keeping that French-German axis going. Um, the, the motor, you could say, of the European Union. So Germany will be looking at France. France will now be looking at Germany, who will be the next partner, right, for that new French president, or Macron again. So, so many things come into play. And of course, on the European level, we now have a precedent of the 
of Britain actually leaving the EU. And there's lots of discontent inside of the European Union. We've got a rift growing also between Western and Eastern member states uh, when it comes to um, visions on uh, ranging from budget to immigration to climate change, everything, everything. So you've got a block still of 27 member states, a huge block, powerful on an, on an economic level, not so much when it comes to defense or foreign policy, unfortunately. But imagine if the French and Germans now falter, I mean, this could have really, yeah. Is it done? I like, are, are we entering a, a phase we should even talk about? Like the EU as we know it is, is, is an essentially gone? Um, I wouldn't say so necessarily, because of course the EU survived these big crises of the last decade. You had the immig immigration or, or the immigrant crisis 2015. Of course, that will return. Huh? That hasn't been handled well. You had the Eurozone crisis with the Euro almost uh, falling to pieces. I remember um, yes. all, everything that happened in Greece and Italy and Spain. So, but of course you could say some of that, or I could say the, um, the fact that Europe didn't falter was also thanks to some of Merkel's policies, even if they were controversial, but she in a way stood at the helm of the EU during all of these crises. So she will be gone. Uh, she hasn't run for re-election now. Her party hasn't done well. We'll have a completely different, different German coalition, different chancellor. And then add to that, that whole unstable situation in France. And we're not even imagining a Le Pen presidency, but lots, yeah, lots of things are at stake in these two main countries, France and Germany. Wow. And, I, and I'm thinking too, with everything that France has been going through during the pandemic, like it hasn't been good and severe, severe uh, lockdowns, severe protests over those lockdowns. The handling of it overall has not been great. Um, there's just so much an angst and anger and um, anxiety and uncertainty going on in the people of France. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not at all feeling confident that um, this the central parties will prevail um mm -hmm. just seeing how like the, the pattern is so similar to what was going on you know in the united states that led up to trump being elected um and i don't want to compare this is not apples to apples these these situations but mm -hmm. there are certain patterns that we can kind of latch on to and recognize when we're looking at how far right is able to um, become mainstream in Western societies. And I do, I do see some similarities, which scares me. Um, I don't know, like, what, what do you think, if you had to give a prediction for, for the election, what, what, what would you say, Tom? Well, it's so hard because as you say, you know, the current political landscape is so splintered. There's no traditional left right divide anymore. And it's the same, as you said, you know, across the Atlantic, but especially, uh, in Europe. So the Socialist Party is still quite weak, even if they have an interesting candidate now, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Um, so she will compete. So that will be interesting. But for the moment, she hasn't made, well, I'd say a big impression, but she might. So that will be very interesting. She's also very keen on pushing the climate agenda. So I'm sure for Parisians, she will be an excellent choice, huh? but I'm not sure if she can rally lots of votes on a national level. So we've got Hidalgo for the Socialist Party, uh, and they really need a win after years of defeats. Uh, we've got the Green Party, but still not strong enough to win a presidential election. Then we've got the extreme left, um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, controversial figure. Uh, um, but again, he will not reach 10% or more. So yeah, and if we look at the Republican Party in France, we're not talking about American Republicans, uh, they exactly. Have, so no confusion there. They have been defeated last time by this new, new movement that Macron founded. And they still have to push a candidate. Another candidate, Xavier Bertrand, used to be a member of the Republicans in France, but left the party. But he's not really making a big name for now. And the irony is that we have a candidate now, maybe for the Republican Party, Michel Barnier, who is the former chief Brexit negotiator. So he actually, in name of the EU, negotiated with the 
Brits, with um, uh, Britain. And this week I saw an article where Boris Johnson apparently was um, attacking Barnier, who wants to run for the French presidency, but almost on the Eurosceptic agenda, where you would think, how is this possible, right? The a little bit of a hypocrite. Yeah. So Johnson was lashing out at Barnier saying, well, there's some hypocrisy in this. The former chief negotiator wanting to keep us in the EU is now running for president in France and trying to get the Eurosceptic vote. So it's just so hard to predict. But I, if I have to make a prediction, right, I would say, well, the easiest prediction would be it'll just be a traditional runoff between Macron um, getting into the second round against Le Pen, and then again, probably Macron still winning, I think. So he might get reelected almost by default because he's not popular and people voting for him would just do it to vote against Le Pen because the real fear is there that this time she could win it. And then the second scenario, and I've read an interesting article there, is that in the first round, you would have a surprising defeat, an unexpected defeat for Macron. So Le Pen gets to the second round against someone else. So oh, is she yeah, facing yeah. up against Hidalgo? Is she facing up against the candidate from the right? Um, who knows? So, and to finish this <laughs> uh, prediction, there's a new, a new kid on the block, you could say, but he's not actually new. So Eric Zemmour, really controversial figure, political analyst, journalist, who since, well, 2010, 11, has written books about basically France going down the drain, in his opinion, because of immigration and, you know. Well, oh, he's anti-everything. Yeah. Interesting figure. His book now, France Hasn't Said Its Last Word, is now topping, you know, the rankings, number one. Uh, I was in Paris this weekend, and you had his book everywhere uh, on the shelves. But he hasn't announced his um, intention to run for president yet. But some people say he's just, well, making preparations. Uh, it'll happen. And of course, he's a media figure. I'm not going to compare him to Trump, because of course, there's been lots of uh, comparisons in, in, in every country possible with Trump, right? Populism, media figure, um, and so on. Exactly. But of course, he's very visible. And people are already saying in the French press that the media are giving too much attention to this guy who might actually, again, you know, get to the second round. Who knows if he keeps on gaining momentum and he's actually doing that now with his book, with his media, um, um, how would you say, interventions or with his interviews. So that's another name to remember, apart from the names that you would have linked to every political party. Here you have an outsider, media figure, really controversial. Um, but well-liked. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I agree with you with not comparing him to Trump because he's actually, he can speak and he's educated and he's very yeah. eloquent and he can make an argument really well. Um, you know, yes, populism and this anti-everything that is mm -hmm. very similar to the ideology of, of Trump and the base. Um, but he's, he's, I would say more like of the established elite. Yep. And, um, unfortunately very well liked. <laughs> so I'll be watching for that now, Tom, I had not heard, uh, any of that chatter. So that's another al alarming development that could happen in the election. I think it'll be, it'll be all about the extremes. How will the extreme left do? And don't forget the whole movement of the Gilets Jaunes, right? Also pushed by the extreme right. left. How will the extreme right to Marine Le Pen? Will she actually make it happen this time or not? Will it be a landslide or will she be defeated unexpectedly? That could also happen. Or besides the extremes, because we're not talking about traditional parties, will it be the outsider coming in and just sweeping everything? And that could also, also happen. And that's what Trump did, of course, in 2016. Exactly. Well, Tom, this has been another fascinating and frightening conversation with you. <laughs> and I appreciate all of your insights. And uh, we will be tuning into the elections next spring. 
And uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm especially concerned just because um, I have a deep, deep love of the EU and want to see it intact for generations to come. And I see it uh, unraveling, especially with all of our issues with pandemic and uh, everything going on with that. I'm just, I'm very, very worried for you, for France, for the EU. And so I'm just going to cross my finger, fingers and keep watching. Yeah, let's hope for the best. I think it'll be really interesting and also to keep an eye on Germany whilst all of this is happening. Because I, I really think, of course, the future of the EU is linked to both of these countries and they're facing extraordinary times in the middle of this COVID recovery. So yeah, it'll be an interesting spring next year in 22. Sure will. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You've been listening to the Progressive World Podcast, brought to you by the Progressive World Federalists. You can reach us through our website at www.progressiveworldfederalists.com. Join us in advocating for stronger global democratic institutions, the decolonization of the international system, and global justice reform.